So when I was in therapy, I was using the Nintendo Wii to play virtual tennis. And that was great. I enjoyed it and it got me physical and it extremely got me extremely fatigued. But um, we, we, there was nothing to do with that data later. There was no way to do anything with it other than it was a good way, a good fun way to do rehabilitation and to try and play tennis with my left hand where I'm usually a right hander. So that was interesting. I like how you're bringing the therapist into this, but then you're also able to access the data and re look into that data, see what patterns are emerging and then use that to benefit people going forward. So that sounds like a really well-rounded, real sort of um, real deep offering. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. Bill Gassiamis from recoveryafterstroke.com here. This is episode 68, and my guests today are the founder and software developer of ReWellio. ReWellio is an organization founded by George Tiefel, a occupational therapist who was frustrated about the amount of rehabilitation time offered to his patients. So he set about creating an app that was going to assist them have more rehabilitation time, either while in rehabilitation or at home, while taking advantage of the world of virtual reality using the ReWellio app. Also, just before we get stuck into it, I wanted to let you know about something that I've been working on that I've finally completed. Uh, it's a free webinar that people can download directly from recoveryafterstroke.com slash webinar. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash webinar to download a free webinar that I created for people on the recovery journey. Everything I do at recoveryafterstroke.com is about creating a place where information can come to share it out to people who have either experienced a stroke or are caring for somebody that's experienced a stroke so that they can go about making their recovery journey a much easier one than when I was making my own recovery journey, which started seven years ago. There was a lot less information out there about how to get back on your feet after stroke. So it was my job, I felt, to create a place where people could do that and have a better version of a recovery than I had. And hopefully I can support people do that with this webinar. In the free webinar, you'll learn how to take action on your recovery now, how to build a vision of the future that will inspire you, and what to do when you are faced with hard decisions about your path forward. You'll also learn the importance of creating a supportive team around you and what kind of people that may involve, as well as how stroke recovery coaching can help speed up your healing. So go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash webinar, download the free webinar, and don't just be a stroke survivor, become a stroke thriver. Uh, Andy Gestahl and George Tofel from Ray Wellio. Welcome to the podcast. Thank Hi. you. Pleasure being here. Thanks so much, guys. I'm really excited about this um, podcast. Uh, I'm always excited about my podcasts, but I really love it when I come across something that I think is a little bit unique and helps my community overcome challenges after stroke. Andy, could you tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do, and how you came to be sure. involved in this organization? Absolutely. So my name is Andy Gestahl. I've been uh, in the startup world for, for over a decade now. I um, have been focusing a lot on uh, mixed reality, so technologies like augmented reality and virtual reality are really my expertise. And um, I, I act as an advisor for Revalue and I've been involved with the company for about a year uh, and a half or so now. Um, I met George uh, quite uh, coincidentally at an event where we started talking and where he shared with me his vision and his idea about um, you know, what he wanted to do for the stroke rehabilitation space. And I was very, um, I was very uh, intrigued and um, got really interested in, in this project. So um, we spent a lot of time initially together talking about um, his ideas and um, you know what he wanted to do in terms of disruption 
uh, of this space. And um, so we found a way to work together. And now um, we're a great team and uh, we're, we're, you know, on this mission of, uh, you know, trying to reinvent the rehabilitation space. Man, I'm loving the sound of that. Tell me, George, about a little bit about yourself. How did you become involved in this space? Um, I founded the company, so I'm the the driving force behind. And the reason is, so I'm a, I'm a physiotherapist, work in the field of stroke rehabilitation, uh, and have a big focus on motor learning. And I'm also having a background as a software developer. And what I experienced during my work with stroke patients is in the rehab center, you have a lot of time, you can do a lot of therapy, but uh, after the patient return, uh, when they're at home, they didn't really improve their function because they have too less therapy time. So that's, that's the reason uh, why I start thinking, what can we do, how we can uh, enable stroke patient more therapy time. And with my background as a software developer, um, especially looked in consumer electronics because they are affordable so everyone can get access to these therapy approaches. So you're a software developer and a physiotherapist? <laughs> First, uh, I became a software developer, but then I decided I want to work with people and not only sitting in the office and uh, <laughs> just doing programming. So I became a physiotherapist and I think that's the main advantage that I know both worlds. Yeah. So the, the, the physical therapy world, the, the therapy world is, a, is completely different than the software world. Uh, people speaking different languages, uh, thinking in different ways. And uh, I think that's a huge problem for many projects um, to get both in the same direction. Wow. Now, that is a really unique thing because one of the challenges that stroke survivors have is, especially when you go to a hospital and deal with doctors, is thankfully the doctors have never had a stroke. And trying to understand what goes on in our bodies and minds, and each person is unique and individual, is such a really difficult thing, I imagine, for them to do, including therapists, occupational therapists, physios, whatever. And it's the communication pathways are, are really um, difficult to sort of bridge. Now, if you or someone you know has experienced a stroke and are in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind, like how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain these things to you, but obviously, because you've never had a stroke before, you may not know what question to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing the things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These are the seven questions that I wished I had asked when I was recovering from my stroke. They'll not only better, they'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide, it's free. And then every so often you come across a neuroscientist that's had a stroke and they happen to be working in the field of uh, you know, the brain when they experience the stroke and it just changes the game about how they can communicate and learn about what's important to stroke survivors and then give us applications for what they've learned in their studies and now how they used it in their stroke rehabilitation. So that's another beautiful, unique bringing together of two completely different worlds, physiotherapy and software development. And that inspired you to do this amazing project, Rewellio, but at the same time, how did you get inspired to do that? Because, you know, a lot of people go and work in physiotherapy and they just do what they can do. They work with what they can work with. And how did you decide that you were going to get involved to bring another aspect of support to your patients? What was their frustrations? What was happening? Um. The basic motivation was a kind of a frustration 
because working in a rehab center, you do all this therapy, you see the, the, the patient improving, um, but on the long term, you see they don't use their full potential for irritation. So, and I w always wanted to push the patient as far as it possible. Um, and therefore I realized that the, the high quality time of a physiotherapist or of occupational therapist, speech therapist, of all the kind of therapists um, is so much limited because of the cost factor. So um, that alone isn't a solution for helping the patient getting the most out of the rotation. So it requires some additional therapy. And when you look out in the market, there are some solution, um, but most of them are very expensive. So the patient don't use them or can't afford them at home. If you look at all the robotics uh, that are out there for stroke irritation, they are too expensive. So that's not the fit for the patient to get the most out of the rotation. You need affordable uh, rotation approaches for home use. Yeah. Because there you have the, the biggest uh, gap of therapy time. Yeah, Andy. I can see that you probably bumped into this guy somewhere. He started telling you these things and how could you not get excited about what he was saying and how could you not want to work in this space with him or find a way to collaborate? So how, what happened with you? How did you decide that you needed to or you wanted to work in this space with, um, with George? Sure, sure. Yeah, it was, um, like I said earlier, it was, you know, it develop, uh, developed a little bit out of the blue because we, we just met at this um, uh, event, you know, purely through accident, really, uh, really just through uh, 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 a common friend. And um, and like I said, I was, you know, I was very much involved in the startup space for the past, you know, uh, over 10 years or so, um, you know, developing, um, you know, augmented reality software, um, you know, through a company um, before this and, um, you know, very much focused on, uh, you know, use cases where this technology can be can be used in the advertising space, you know, in other enterprise uh, environments, in the gaming industry, um, you know, in all sorts of different environments, but really not in the medical space or in the healthcare space at all. So, um, you know, when I listened to to George and his cause and his mission, um, you know, it was a completely new, uh, uh, you know, subject matter for me, something that I hadn't been involved with uh, before. But I saw that, um, you know, that the cause is, a, is an extremely good cause and it's really something that the world needs. It's not something that um, is, is there for entertainment or for fun or, you know, for, for, for a moment of joy. Um, but, it's, but it's something that um, can really change lives and really can, can change um, you know, how people uh, live their daily, their daily lives. And, and that's what, what interests me, um, uh, you know, at this point in my life. And uh, it's, it's something that, um, uh, that I found extremely attractive. And, and George, you know, uh, George's unique skill set, um, as he explained earlier, with the combination of understanding the physical um, uh, therapy space and also the software development and, you know, just having an overall uh, good sense for technology and, uh, you know, um, being inventive and, you know, coming up with new concepts. I really thought this is a great um, opportunity for me to get involved. And, 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 I, and that's why I couldn't say no, really. Yeah, excellent. So we're talking about Rewellio um, and Rewellio is a, uh, it's a virtual reality device, isn't it? That stroke survivors wear. Tell me a little bit about what Actually, it is because we haven't spoken about it yet, and we've been going uh, for ten minutes or so. Uh, it's, <laughs> um, so the the basic idea, or let me start another way. The one of the biggest challenges of stroke rehabilitation is getting back a functional use of the hand. So, because if a patient can move a little bit, or even if he can't move anything, uh, it's there are very few therapy approaches out there that work really well. You have mirror therapy, you have uh, observation of movement, uh, motor imagery, but all these approaches are very limited because the patient has no feedback. And as soon as a patient can grab and release things, you have very effective therapy approaches like uh, SIM therapy, forced use therapy to push this uh, this um, this uh, motor activities. But to get there, it's very difficult, uh, and most of the patients don't get there because 
of the they don't know what to do or there is nothing to do what truly really works. So the, the basic idea for value was that patient without a functional use of a hand can experience the hand in a full range of motion in VR. So the basic idea is to move mirror therapy in VR. So you have a headset on, you have a healthy hand in VR, and you have a second hand controlled uh, with EMG or anima animated. Okay. So that was the basic idea. Okay, so when, and... I, when I was going through therapy, hand therapy, after surgery, uh, I woke up, couldn't feel my left side, so I need to rehabilitation to walk and to feel my left side. Uh, I was in hospital waiting to get to therapy and being evaluated, and I didn't have mirror therapy. I didn't have any therapy yet. It was two or three days before I actually went into rehab for the first time. I was imagining myself using my arm and using my leg. So tell me, does how does virtual reality work? Does it tap into that imagery, that imagination side of the brain where it, it fires off the same neuronal structures as if I was actually doing that? Or does it take over another path? Does it take another path to that result? Uh, it is not a part. If you think of, of motor imagery, you think of, of the movement, but you have no feedback of if you're thinking in the right way uh, or if you're really concentrating on this in the right way. So you, do, you don't know. It's a perfect approach, but there are some limitations. Uh, and what we see that most of the patients have at least a very little EMG activation, even if it's it's not visible. A little bit of? And what we what, do, we what, what, EMG. What was that? A little bit of what? Activation? Uh, EMG activation. There was some muscle activation, even if you don't see them. Uh -huh. And so, and we are amplifying this signal. So the patient gets the feedback of sending down a signal, trying to activate the flex or the extensor and seeing really changing the, the signal on the, the display. Uh huh. So now you have, you have the, the motor feedback loop sending a signal down and getting some uh, activation. Just for clarification, um, so there's really um, two things here. One is uh, virtual reality, and the other one is uh, EMG biofeedback, which Revelio is also using in a very unique way. So uh, sticking to virtual reality only for a moment, um, that, uh, you know, the, the, the power here of virtual reality is, of, is of course, to, to mimic some aspects of uh, mirror therapy as one aspect of it, which means that, you know, instead of, you know, staring at a uh, physical uh, mirror that is set up in front of you on the table and, you know, moving your healthy hand uh, and kind of looking at, you know, uh, uh, the, the mirror image of your healthy hand, um, you know, stimulating your brain accordingly to to get you know movement back into the affected hand is is uh, you know is is obviously an activity that gets boring very quickly. And with uh, virtual reality, this is um, something that we can do in a more uh, actually in a more fun way, in a more um, uh, entertaining uh, entertaining way because we can. Uh, have you know we can create games with different uh, things that you can you know uh, accomplish as you move your um, healthy hand and you can um, achieve scores you can you know go through different levels you could uh, you know instant gratification you can um, you know have a little bit of fun actually and 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 that's one approach so with uh, EMG uh, uh, biofeedback uh, which uh, George just uh, described um, uh, as a second bit here is um, we use uh, you know some EMG uh, biofeedback armbands that are out there. So different sensors that that can be used. Uh, you know one of them is is, is the Mayo, which um, you know actually uh, has have you know has been used before also in some aspects in some research labs um, for stroke stroke rehabilitation. And that's the aspect where we can detect uh, some. Um, you know, some uh, signals coming from the brain that will reach the the underarm, uh, even though the underarm is not um, or the hands are not moving at all. We can still detect some super uh, minor signals um, that reach, uh, you know, the muscles that are moving the hand. And then we can take those signals and we can amplify these and then visualize it through virtual reality also. Wow. So that means that 
when you think of moving your hand, even though you don't see any actual movement in your, in your hand, we can visualize that movement in virtual reality. So your eyes perceive a moving hand, again, you know, then stimulating your brain with instant gratification. Okay, so this thought was correct, and I see the, the, the moving hand, which then, um, you know, has a positive effect on the learning effect and can actually then trigger some movement again into the affected hand. So those are two aspects really working together. Wow. So you, the, the biofeedback um, is the part that I was missing when I was imagining my hand moving. I was moving it, um, guys, but it wasn't telling me anything in response. It wasn't saying, yep, in okay. fact, you did move it. That's the result of your movement. Yeah, that's, that's exactly good. that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, and we do a little bit more. We, we track the flexor and extensor muscles. What you often see with stroke patients is that they can flex a little bit, but they can't extend again. So we, and there are some, uh, some electric simulation systems out there um, that try to activate the extensor. And what we are doing, we are trying to retrain the activation pattern of the hand. So we can learn, the, we can relearn the patient with the feedback of the muscle activation to relax the flexor and to activate the extensor at the same time. Normally the flexor uh, working very well, it's a very dominant signal, but it's too dominant that the extensor signal uh, isn't going through, you have no feedback and you don't learn how to activate this. And with Full Valley you can learn to activate both the flexor and extensor muscle in the right way to learn to reopen the hand again. Wow. And with the, with the EMG biofeedback, with the feedback you're seeing, you can trigger something with your own activation pattern. Uh, we prevent learned non-use. And that's one of the biggest issue in stroke rehabilitation, especially for the hand rehabilitation. Um, people need to repeat this activation again and again um, to improve this motor functions and adding a little bit of gamification. Um, they are doing more repetitions, uh, they are better prepared for a session with the therapist so they can make more progress. Yeah, that's interesting. That word that you said, learnt non-use. So people hear about neural plasticity and they think, well, it's an amazing thing. We can create uh, new pathways and we can use neural plasticity to benefit us. But what people don't realize is that the negative side of neural plasticity is that you can untrain the brain and because the brain is pr plastic, if there's something that you're not using it, you can lose it. And um, that can go forever if you don't practice that area. So I love the fact that there's an intervention there for learned non-use. So has the method or the program or the process, whatever you call it, uh, has it been tested on patients at the moment? Um, we are out of some pilot customers, rehab centers in Austria, Germany, UK, uh, and the United States. And the, the basic approaches we are using are evidence-based. EMG biofeedback is used a lot in, in rehabilitation, in other spaces, but also in stroke rehabilitation. So there is some evidence out there uh, that we are based on. And what we are also doing at Ruvalli is that we are collecting all this research uh, data and put them in a in the product. Because it's another huge problem that you have a lot of uh, prototypes and research projects out there that show, oh, that's amazing, that's something you can do, um, but most of that don't reach any patient. They're just uh, for, for clinical data, for research, but not for the daily life of a stroke patient. So the patients or the trial patients that you're using it with, are they people that have left the rehabilitation space and are now at home and are they using it at home um, by themselves both. as it's intended? Both, both. Um, the, the user journey or the patient journey, if you want to call it uh, this way, is if you have suffered a stroke and you come to rehab, you should get to know the system. So, and if you like it, if you can see that uh, that's something you can uh, benefit from, you should be able to do it at home. That's the, the way. And you also can connect with your therapist. Your, your therapist can uh, watch what you're doing, how you're improving. Um, but the main focus is, is to use true value at home. Mm -hmm. And has there been any feedback yet from the patients that are trialing the product to give you some kind of 
an idea of how they're traveling or what they've noticed different? Um, what most of the patients say that they are surprised how sensitive they can activate their, their hand to get a different uh, reaction. Because normally they deflect, that's a very common activation pattern for them, but uh, the feedback most of the time is really they're surprised how sensitive they have to activate in a different way and to get a different result. So making them more sensitive is, is one of the, the most uh, benefits. We've seen some patients without uh, any visible movements. They can now um, they've strengthened this uh, motor feedback loop and now they can move a little bit, but it's always a long process like stroke rotation always is. And with a chronic stroke patient, we see uh, the patient learn to reduce their muscle tension. So if they have a very stiff hand, using Revalue, they learn to relax the flexor, they learn to active, uh, relax them, and so the hand gets softener, which is also a, a huge step for them. Wow. So you're saying that the hand, which seems for a lot of people not to move, just goes stuck, closes, gets clenched. You're saying that there's some patients that are no, starting to notice that they can um, make that less clenched and feel a little bit more open. Yes. Um, if they can open the hand in a passive way. Yeah. If it, the hand is closed and the structures are so, so tight yeah. uh, that it's not possible to open, then not. But with uh, some patient, um, you can passively open the hand. Mm -hmm. And with full value, you learn to, uh, to relax the muscles so the hand gets softener. So, yeah. and um, they are coming quicker to the state where the hand is softener. Wow. So we've spoken a lot about the hand so far. What in what other areas can this technology assist people recovering from stroke? We uh, the main focus is to look at technology and see how we can use this technology in a therapeutic, meaningful way. So with the MG bio feedback, we are focusing on the hand. Uh, with VR, we are mostly focusing on the arm. So with the controller, you can track, you can track the range of motion, you can adapt the exercise to the patient um, to motivate him. Uh, and we're also looking into visual field impairments, uh, neglect, because in VR, you can track all the events and to which events the, the patient is responding or not. So you can adjust the situation, especially for the, the patient. Yeah, wow. And we have a research corporation running to look into uh, the cognitive side. And the big picture of full value is um, to get a better overview of the patient. Um, because normally you have the assessments in the rehab center and then the therapists say, okay, maybe there's a problem with the vision, maybe there's a problem with uh, the cognition. Uh, you have some assessments at specific time points. Uh, and what we are doing is we are collecting data in real time and see how we can look into this data uh, to track every day and see how we can personalize the therapy. Right. So is there some way that I can, if I was using your program or your device, is there some way that I can track back and have a look and see how far I've come? Because one of the things that uh, I think is important for stroke survivors is that they have a, a, the ability, and I often tell people is, get your loved ones to get video of you taking your first steps, taking your, you know, yep. steps in a month. Can we track how we're coming along and how far we've come? Can we show that to patients? That's a core element of what we're doing. Uh, right now we're building up our dashboard <clears throat> where we track all the data about your exercise time and we call it motion map. So in VR, uh, we are generating a map of your range of motion where you can see how, inc how you increase this range of motion over time. Wow. So, and the video diary, I believe, is also a key component that we offer within the app. So it's exactly what you just said. Um, you know, we give the patient the ability to record at a certain time and then, you know, watch it later so they get a really good idea of the progress. That's a, a side project we are doing because it's what, what many therapists do, recording a, a video on the smartphone of the, the patient. Uh, and we set up a, a video diary where you can compare 
a specific task where you take a video or in the, the timeline. For example, walking, you can record today and compare it with a video recorded six months ago or a year ago and see really side by side the difference. Because stroke patient, it takes a lot of time and most of the patient improve uh, small step by steps. Yeah. And seeing this small improvements is very important for the motivation. Uh, and that's a part where we want to support the patient, show them how he has improved with the uh, therapy time, how he has improved the range of motion with the speed of motion, uh, to show him all these parameters to say, hey, you're doing progress. It's going in the right way. Keep going. Yeah. So, Bill, just to, just to clarify, um, uh, you know, Revelio is a software company. So the devices that we use are devices uh, that are out there in the market that anyone can pick up from, you know, a Best Buy in the United States or uh -huh. like, you know, a human electronics store that you can order on Amazon. So we, we look for these devices um, that are affordable, that are mobile, and that are, you know, within uh, reach and, you know, access for, for anyone out there. And um, so that's why we, we, we built on iPads, on, you know, Android tablets, which most of us have at home anyway. And then we obviously look into, you know, uh, mobile virtual, virtual reality headsets that, um, that are now, you know, literally this year only beginning to uh, become affordable and really practical uh, in many ways. And then, um, and then we, you know, on our website, of course, we, we direct, uh, you know, patients or uh, therapists, you know, to these various hardware products where they can buy them, where they can order them uh, on Amazon and, and, and whatnot. But we're a software company. And, you know, one element of developing software or really, um, you know, the Revelio app, I mean, that's what it is. What, that's what you download onto your iPad or onto your tablet to begin with. Um, and that's where we, you know, offer all these different exercises for the uh, different um, modules, you know, uh, George mentioned, um, you know, the hand, the arm, mm -hmm. speech, uh, vision, you know, cognition, all these different areas um, that we that we address with the different exercises. And for these different exercises, then you you will always need the iPad or you will always need the, the Android tablet. That's always the basis to begin with. And then we have these accessories. Um, which you may or may not use for, you know, for certain uh, extended exercises. And, and that's where the, the VR headset comes in, or that's where the EMG biofeedback armband comes in, or perhaps, you know, other devices, accessory devices that we may use in the future. But we're a software company and we, and we um, collect, you know, through, the, uh, through these powerful sensors that we have within these devices, we can collect a lot of um, you know, data, as, as George uh, mentioned, um, obviously under very strict, you know, uh, uh, privacy uh, policies and, and uh, uh, you know, making sure that, um, uh, you know, that, that that's very well protected. We, we, we collect all this data and, and that's how we understand the condition of the patient. We understand, for example, as George mentioned, the range of motion. We understand perhaps, you know, on the cognitive uh, side of things, you know, what's, what tasks uh, he or she can uh, accomplish or fulfill and what perhaps, um, you know, is, is, is potentially uh, limited in terms of the vision when, when using the VR headset and looking at certain objects in the virtual world that she or he can or cannot see. So, you know, collecting all of this data, we're trying to, um, you know, establish a picture um, of, the, of the patient and understanding the condition. And then uh, based on this, uh, we call it the patient engine. Based on this, we we then recommend, um, you know, the appropriate, um, you know, exercises that are right for for that particular patient. Because every patient, as you as you know very well, is, is different. Mm. Um, some have, uh, you know, uh, problems in one area, and then, um, you know, uh, some other patients have, uh, you know, problems in multiple areas. And and we try to understand um, this profile, and then, you know, offer the uh you know the exercises that fit for this particular person and then also for for that particular person you know in the right moment uh, or time rather of you know within the process of of uh, of the therapy um you know uh as 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 the person progresses so that's the idea that's the overall um 
a picture of, of what we're trying to do really yeah do you expect it to be um that tailored even though um if if it gets if it goes worldwide and viral there's going to be a lot of people coming on board that you can't all that can't all access yourselves or somebody how does somebody on the other side of the planet get a specific tailored program to the exercises that they require um we also recommend to use Woo Value in addition to a one-to-one -one setting with a therapist. Ah, so we, we, we don't want to replace, and it's not possible to replace the therapy with the one-to-one -one settings. Uh, that's the, the high quality time. And with this, we, we generate additional therapy time for the patient to increase the therapy time. And that's the key for the outcome of the rotation. So it always needs uh, both sides and both sides can do different things in, a, in, a, in the best way. If you look on the, on the, the technical side with consumer electronics, with the, the gamification, uh, what we are doing, uh, that's a great way to doing more repetition to get a, get a, a, a better preparation. So the, the representation of the hand or of the arm, for example, is better is better prepared for the session with the therapist in the one-to-one -one settings. So the, the therapist in the one-to-one -one setting uh, can start with a better, uh, better situation of the patient to get a better improvement and can um, set up all this uh, preparation in a functional way in the, in the whole picture. If you think of arm rehabilitation, um, you need to do your, your movements but you also have the right alignment of the shoulder, of the, your trunk. There are so many things you have to work on with a therapist and bring both together is the best outcome for the patient. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, I like the sound of that. So when I was in therapy, I was using the Nintendo Wii to play virtual tennis. And that was great. I enjoyed it and it got me physical and it extremely got me extremely fatigued. But um, we, we, there was nothing to do with that data later. Where there was no way to do anything with it other than it was a good way, a good fun way to do rehabilitation and to try and play tennis with my left hand where I'm usually a right hander. So that was interesting. I like how you're bringing the therapist into this, but then you're also able to access the data and look into that data, see what patterns are emerging, and then use that to benefit people going forward. So that sounds like a really well-rounded, real sort of um, real deep offering of support and then ongoing support and service to other people who are coming, unfortunately, down the line of needing stroke rehabilitation. Um, so how mm -hmm. have you found, how have you found the therapists and their acceptance of this new way of doing rehabilitation. Has there been some concerns about what you're proposing? Um, it needs a lot of uh, explanation what we're doing to show them how the patient can benefit. And as I said before, thinking of stroke rehabilitation means long-term rehabilitation. So most of the, the therapists in the neurological field are looking for additional therapies for the patient because they know to get the most out of the rehabilitation, they need more therapy time. And as a therapist, you can't deliver that much therapy that they needed. So most of them are very open-minded, especially the younger ones are very interested in technology and, and how to bring some new approaches into the, the daily therapy business. Yeah, that's great. Those new ones, those new young ones are always the ones that uh, we want to look to to take on new technology and to be the early adopters because they are very keen, they're very excited and they are still full of hope that they are going to save the planet and the people and everything. So we really want to get them at that right time when they're really excited. <laughs> um, I love the sound and, of it. And for the most of the therapists, the best thing they can see is seeing their patient improving. Yeah, it's so rewarding. It would be very that, that, rewarding. That's why we're doing the job. Yeah. Um, are there any limitations to the software at the moment, things that you're working on that you hope to have that are not available at the moment? Uh, we are very early stage. We have uh, our EMG biofeedback system out there. 
we have our uh, VR systems working on the Oculus Quest to release it and also on the HTC Vive Focus. So um, that should be available very soon. And we have some research collaboration for the personalization of the therapy to have with the universities a look into the data we are generating and see how we can learn or how we can answer some questions of the researchers and how we can use that information to adapt the therapy situation to the patient so to get them better therapy for the patient. Sounds That's a, a learning process for the, the next years. <laughs> we are always learning. Sounds like an amazing uh, so thesis. That's what we're right now. It's very amazing, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you plan on rolling it out? If, you, you're, if you're five years down the track, you've gathered some data, you've had some trials running, you've had some therapists online, what's the process look like when you start to begin to roll it out? How do you recruit more occupational therapists in more countries? It seems like a little bit of a logistical challenge. Um, we are focusing on the, the online side. So we try to reach as many therapists and patients over social media, uh, our website, share the information, what we're doing, how we're doing, uh, who can benefit, uh, what are the limitations of who value, so that it's clear what we're doing and what we can't do. Um, and the basic idea is that it's uh, simply working out of the box. So if you have your Oculus Quest, your HTC, your tablet, you download the app, there are tutorial videos guiding you through the exercises, what you can do, what, what's the focus of this exercise. Um, and it should work very simple. And what's because the... to experience it, stroke therapy or this, all these approaches have to work for the users in a very, very simple way. Uh, otherwise, it's for research and not for a daily life. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the focus on it. it has to be for daily life and then the research also is an important part of it but definitely as somebody who uh, was looking for any solution possible at the beginning to make sure I got back on my feet and I know there's people that are still doing that two three four five ten years after stroke um, anything that they can do um, that's focused around the patient is very much appreciated and needed and wanted what does it cost to download the app uh, right now it's free, it's a trial version uh, and we'll switch later this year to a paid uh, version. It will be a monthly fee, about it's about 30 euros in Europe. So it's, I don't know what is in US dollars, uh, in Australian dollars. Yeah, in Australian dollars uh, it's about think... 1 million at the moment. The Australian dollar is not worth much uh, compared to the euro, but um, <laughs> never mind, you know, we'll, we'll work it out. <laughs> but but the business model is based on a monthly fee for the, the software and the hardware you buy on your own. Um, but as Andy mentioned before, it's consumer electronics, so VR devices can also be used by, by other parts of the family. Um, yeah. So and the software is in the, the price range, will be. Yeah, and it's an ongoing fee, but it's not something that people need to commit to forever. They commit to it for as long as they want. When they find the re get the results that they need, then they're done with that. Yes, exactly. It, yeah. You well, can cancel it any time. It's a monthly uh, fee, and for for stroke patient, if you reach some some level, uh, there is a point where you need a break. <clears throat> so, and that's where you can cancel it. And after some months, and you say, okay, now I'm full of energy again. I want to reach uh, new goals. You can uh, reactivate the, your account and uh, start start the therapy again. So, just as a side note, um, uh, from me here, you know, working in the in the startup space for for a long time, you know, obviously, you know, one of the objectives that you have as you create a business is, of course, that you wanna. You know, you want your customers to basically be with you and subscribe to whatever service you're providing for as long as possible, because that's how you make money and that's how you, uh, you know, build a business. But in this case, of course, is um, well, of course, we, we need to sustain our business and we want, you know, obviously patients to 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 use Revalue um, as long as they want and as long as they can. On the other hand, of course, you know, once they stop using Revalue, it makes us happy too because we know that uh, we we solve their, you know, uh, potentially improve their lives and 
you know, maybe even solved, you know, some of the problems that they had. So it's a, it's a bit of a two-edged sword there. <laughs> yeah, you guys, um, you're not going to be short of patients, unfortunately, because the stroke statistics are one in six people will have a stroke in their lifetime, you know, and uh, 60% of those will get back to work. 40% are sitting at home trying to get back to some kind of normal life. And that's a very large number of people. Unfortunately, most of the strokes are caused due to uh, lifestyle factors. Uh, according to the World Stroke Organization, 80% of strokes are preventable. That's crazy. So we're, we've really done a good job of getting ourselves unwell now to rely on people like you to come up with solutions to make us better. And if you think 30 euro or 50 Australian dollars or 40 uh, American dollars is a lot of money per month to keep you well or to get you better, I mean, that's got nothing on how much it's cost me to be sick from stroke in the last seven years. It's cost me, you know, more than half a million Australian dollars easy. That's just being conservative. And that is not in money that I've had to spend. That is in money that I haven't made that I haven't been able to earn, that I haven't been able to, you know, go about my business every single day that I, like I used to. So uh, absolutely, I encourage people to make money from stroke survivors in a beautiful way, in a way that's supportive and offers uh, great value. There's nothing wrong with making money in that space and there's nothing wrong with expecting people to pay $30 a month or 30 euro a month to allow you to continue to make the software better and better and better and better because that's in the end what we want is the most amazing version of this and hopefully you know version one is offering amazing value but version 10 is 10 times or 100 times better than version one and that's really what our community has not had the opportunity to do i went to rehab in a month i was discharged from rehab then i went home and I was doing outpatient rehabilitation three days a week. And I had to travel uh, to that by the time I got there and by the time I did my one-hour rehab and by the time I got home, there was four hours of my day gone three days a week. So even if I wanted to get back to work, there was three days a week that I definitely couldn't because I was committed to my rehabilitation. I needed to get better. So anything that can be done inside the home is also going to benefit people because it's going to decrease their time which is means it's going to decrease the cost to travel which means it's going to decrease you know their fatigue which means it's going to just make it a lot easier and that's part of what recovery after stroke is doing i want to put together coaching and training programs and courses on wellness for brain wellness that people don't have to go out to do because it was such a difficult thing for me to do but one very important message I want to add here is um, that the aim of your value is to add more therapy time so to get a faster and better rehabilitation. That's very important for myself as a therapist. We don't want to replace your free time visit with a, to your therapist. We just want to add more therapy time. Yeah. So um, from the mindset that that's very important um, that our mindset is to increase the therapy time. Yeah. I love that. So, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. So if I could increase my therapy time after my my sessions, because in Australia it was all paid for by the government. We have an amazing medical system. So when I get home after my three months of outpatient rehab, I don't have any more therapy time unless I have money to pay for it up front. And it costs way more than $30 a month for me to see each one of those people for an hour. So to be able to do that at home you know, increases my therapy time after therapy has ceased or after I've no longer qualified for additional therapy. And I know in America, some people struggle even more to get therapy and to get in front of people because their medical system is, um, their, their Medicare system is, you know, very um, limited. So, yeah. Um, Maybe just to um, add one more point um, to this because you, um, you mentioned that you were playing the Wii for some of your, um, uh, you know, exercises that you that you did previously. Of course, you know, there's, um, you know, some clinics out there where you, um, where you come in and they have, uh, you know, various devices, uh, you know, set up where then the patient can sit down and interact maybe with a Wii like this or maybe with um, some other 
you know, virtual reality systems that have been around in the past, you know, that were connected to a stationary PC that you had to wire up with cables that are, you know, that were very expensive. And and I just want to point out, be, you know, the, the this uh, mobility aspect um, that that you also explained, you know, with your commute going back and forth and, you know, taking a lot of time and being uh, very uh, time intensive. You know, the beauty here is that um, really this year, um, 2019, earlier this year was really the time um, when the first uh, virtual reality headsets uh, came out that were completely untethered, that were completely uh, mobile with, um, you know, controllers and systems uh, attached to it that really um, enable the kinds of exercises that we want to do. So this is really a great moment in time. Um, we're literally doing things now that were not possible only a year ago. And and, and that's also why we're so excited about this, um, because it solves this big issue of, of uh, uh, you know, being dependent almost on on your on your clinic, on on your on, on the fact that you have to drive there. Perhaps you need you even need you know, a loved one to 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 sit yeah. with you in the car yeah. and to take up their time as well. And, and, you know, to some extent, these uh, mobile devices, you know, whether that's an iPad or whether that's a virtual reality headset, it really solves this problem um, in, in many ways. And, and like George uh, says, it, it, you know, it's a great opportunity to add more therapy time. Yeah, it's beautiful, guys. I really appreciate the fact that there are so many people out there doing this kind of work for people like me. I find it fascinating that you guys wake up in the morning and you want to make a product to help people like me and I don't even know you. It's just absolutely fascinating and I love you for it and I'm so pleased that you're doing it. And it's one of the things that I'm grateful for. You know, I do gratitude journals from time to time. I don't physically write anything down, but I have this little gratitude practice. And one of the things I'm grateful for is all the neuroscientists, all the doctors who wake up and do thousands of hours of you know of study to open people's heads and take things out and put things in and fix things i mean it's just completely mind mind blowing you know and i just completely and totally love that you guys are doing that so thank you so much i really appreciate your time today thank you for doing what you are doing i truly uh, feel like um if i'm going if somebody's going to have a stroke it's the best time in the world ever to have a stroke uh, if that's even something possible to say um so um, where can people listening and watching uh, find out more about uh, your products and what you do? Sure, maybe I'll take that one. Um, yeah, you can, of course, go to our website, um, uh, revelio.com, uh, can easily be found. But what we also love to encourage you to uh, become part of our community because we're you know, we're doing a lot of work on social media. So obviously you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube. We have a lot of, a lot of things up there. Um, just, just Google Rewellio and you'll find us uh, there. We also have a newsletter, which we send out every month, um, you know, to keep um, our followers updated on the, on, you know, some of the things that we do. We, we actually attend a lot of uh, events. Um, uh, in fact, uh, a, a big event here in Germany is coming up called uh, Reha Care, which is in Dusseldorf. Uh, on uh, September 18th. So we'll be there, we'll be exhibiting, we have a booth there and so forth. So subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on social media is really um, the best way to, to, to get in touch and to follow what we're doing. Um, and like George, uh, as George said, you know, we're, we're still fairly early stage. So there's a lot of things still up in the pipeline, still in development and still uh, coming. So we want to make sure that we have a have a way to connect with with uh, uh, your listeners and your audience out there going forward. So so make sure to subscribe um, yeah. to the various channels. Yeah, excellent. I'll have all the all the um, links to all of the social media platforms and all of that uh, in the notes. So we'll get that at the end of the episode. Um, George, any last words? We try to build value from therapists for therapists and patients. Therefore, we also need the feedback of the community. And as Andy said, we also invite everyone, uh, give us feedback, uh, tell us what you would like to see in Rural Value, get involved so we can make the best experience for the patient, uh, the therapist, for the rehabilitation. Excellent. 
Guys, once again, thanks so much for being on the Recovery After Stroke podcast. Your product is and your work is perfect for my podcast. And that's why I was so excited to connect with you both and to share your work. Just in case anyone's listening and they're wondering, I've got nothing to do with the guys. I don't have any interest in the organization. Um, I'm just somebody who loves to share amazing work. And um, this is exactly what I'm doing. So thanks again. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.